BBC Radio 5 Live, 22 minutes past midnight. You're with Phil Williams through till one. And I'm delighted to say our midnight expert for you tonight is a man that you will have watched on the BBC screens for many a year. Daniel Corbett is a meteorologist who worked for the Met Office and the Beeb up until May of 2011. He's now based in New Zealand, forecasting the weather for TVNZ. Hi, Daniel. How are you doing? I'm all right. How are you doing? Yeah, very well, thanks. What's uh, is it? Uh, is it some ungodly hour with you, or are we okay? No, no, it's it's uh, late morning, just before lunchtime here, so it's it's quite a pleasant hour. It's uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, uh, very pleasant indeed. Uh, not no problems at all. Uh, now Daniel's here to take your weather questions, so you can get them through to us via at BBC Five Live on social media. You can text them to eight five zero five eight. There's a lot of things to talk about. At the moment, and all sorts of things predicted, like typhoons and monsoons, and uh, does that same level of um, heightened excitement about the weather happen where you are now working in New Zealand, or are people a bit less obsessed? Well, no, it, that, that's the one thing that folks in New Zealand and the UK, it's just it's that common thread. You know, always talk about the weather. You know, you literally, you know, everyone knows in the UK what it's like. You go outside and say. Oh, it's turned out fine again, or, or you know, always talking about it, and it's the same in New Zealand because uh, they are literally in the middle of the uh, the ocean between the uh, tropics and the poles. They get everything thrown at them, plus a couple of kitchen sinks uh, uh, thrown sideways. Uh, we're in the throes of winter. But the other curious thing as well, what's been going on around the globe? You maybe remember when we we chatted uh, well, a few weeks back. We yeah. were talking about El Nino, yes. and that is already starting to impact the weather across the globe and you know in you know all sort of indirect threads uh, what it's doing to the Pacific Ocean it's like you know somebody said you know you have a typical bathtub that's filled with ice and a little bit of lukewarm water and all of a sudden somebody said let's put about six dozen Bunsen burners beneath this thing we're going to blow you know blow the, uh, the heat through this thing and it's just steaming away water temperatures up three to five degrees above normal and it's just sending all this steam and water vapor and energy um, into the um, you know the atmosphere and of course that gets into the jet streams and we're talking about typhoons and you know, you can just go down the list of all the things. It's, uh, uh, and we're not really at the peak of the El Nino yet, so it's, it's, it's just, sort of, uh, just really sort of starting to ramp up and get itself going. But it is affecting our weather already in uh, indirect ways. Uh, Janet in Liverpool has sent an email for you, Daniel. says, hello, Phil. I get a bit obsessed and depressed with the weather during the summer months compared with the rest of the year. I saw a, lo- <laughs> I saw a longish range weather forecast last night, which had a warm southern wind coming to Britain next week, I think which stops short of Merseyside, which had the blue for cold, as this was on the BBC. Also, most of the continent had really hot weather during July, with the only exception being the British Isles. Could Dan please explain why London and the South East get the best of temperatures compared with the rest of the country, especially us up north? Also... Why, when the low pressure comes in from the Atlantic, Britain does seem to be the only European country to get all the bad weather and not the good weather, says Janet in Liverpool. Yeah, perfect question. And, of course, there's, there's different parts to that. Of course, um, Britain being, um, you know, as we know, right on the, uh, the end of the, uh, the Gulf Stream, and, of course, the main jet stream that runs across the North Atlantic, which undulates uh, like, a, uh, like a flexing piece of... Um, uh, plastic, but right now it's literally like a wet piece of spaghetti. It's flexing around, and that's been why uh, there's been a change in the summer weather. Everyone remembers uh, late June and July. Everyone was baking in the UK, but you know you'd rather just forget about it over the last several weeks because of things that have changed. The main thing being the jet stream, and then a couple of the other oscillations. One being the North Atlantic oscillation, uh, which uh, really uh, talks about the strength of the jet stream and then the strength, of course, of the, the lows and the highs, the Azores high, which is the one that always brings us that fine weather. The Azores high was huge in late June, but look for it now. You could barely find it on the weather map, so that's why it's changed. Uh, but, of course, yeah, uh, further north you are across the UK, you're away from the continent, so you don't have that, uh, mu- that uh, warmer air from the continent just moderating things, but you've, of course, got more of that st- stuff that just comes straight in off the Atlantic. So there we go, Janet. I hope that helps. Janet has uh, fulfilled all obligations by ending her email with Up the Villa, which you do need to do if you want to get your email or text read out tonight on Five Live whilst I'm talking to you. Stapleford Railway, next up on Twitter, says, please ask Dan if there's any sign of the Gulf Gulf Stream reversing or shifting, causing a mini ice age here. 
That's a good question. And it's very difficult to say, and particularly because that's something that takes that longer term research and, you know, in the shorter term day to day weather forecasting, we're obviously looking at the weather systems, the weather patterns, and then the trends, the trends which are like the seasonal influences like El Nino and a few of the other oscillations. But um, that's a difficult one as a weather forecaster to sort of pin down and say in the actual day-to-day -day maps um, it's, we don't really see that sort of thing because we've obviously got these other things that are affecting our weather but um, of course there's loads of research going on about that and people talk about that potentially happening but then also people talk uh, just as strongly about um, uh, the global warming and how things will uh, be impacted by that. So it's uh, lots of different arguments about various different things that uh, you know can affect uh, our weather over the um, over the, the, mm. you know, the coming future. Really, how um, there's been a lot of chat about this here, uh, Daniel. How the technology has improved and how accurate you can do a longer range forecast for now. I think the the expected range at one point was about three to four days, wasn't it? Yeah, exactly. And they talk about it in the same here in New Zealand. Every 10 years, the computers get um, better and faster. So you can almost add a day in accuracy to the longer range forecast. So you can, if you remember, you know, maybe like sort of our, our parents or grandparents, they'll remember where you literally, uh, they might sort of tune into the radio and they'd say, right, the weather tomorrow will be rubbish or the weather tomorrow will be lovely. And that's about all they do because you could, didn't have the strength. And even going back into the 80s, we all, we all remember the 87 storm, or some of us do, uh, just since then, the strength of the computer model has increased so much that uh, things like that are um, uh, far less likely. But that said, once we go beyond about five or six days, because there's so many different things that can uh, just flux and change with the atmosphere, uh, a weather forecast is almost like taking a, a snapshot, a photo, but then the atmosphere is still moving. And so that's why it, uh, uh, you go into those days beyond, even though we get better, we still always have that last thing, that uh, Mother Nature keeping the one hand behind her back saying, ha-ha, I got you. <laughs> <laughs> That's why, you know, we'll, all, we'll always be sitting there saying, well, yeah, the bank holiday will work out fine. And, you know, we get there and it's just, it's just, it's gone, you know, it's gone pear-shaped mm. or something because mm. the further out in advance, there are more variables to throw in. How deep will that low be? Where will it be positioned? How much moisture? All those things that can uh, come into the mix and just make... Uh, Weather forecasting, fascinating, but sometimes also quite frustrating to do. Daniel Corbett, meteorologist with us this evening. He's your expert tonight, so if you've got a question about the weather, he's your man. Call now, 0500 909 693. You can text your question to 85058 or tweet it to at BBC Five Live. 12.43 and it's Phil Williams with you on Five Live for another 17 minutes. You're in the company of Daniel Corbett, meteorologist, who, um, who's with us. Who's there? Who's on his mobile phone? You've had. Uh, we should explain, really. Uh, Daniel was sat in his office uh, answering your questions, and now he's on manoeuvres because there's been a fire alarm. <laughs> so, uh, but such uh, the trooper that he is, he is on a mobile phone, and still, you're still all right to take questions, then, are you? Absolutely, yeah. You know, that's, that's how it goes. I'm really sorry about that. But, yeah, you know, you probably remember in our, our days of the beam when we had fire drills, you just have to, uh, you just go and run, and that's, that's what you do. But, yes, um, absolutely, all, all set for you. <laughs> Excellent. So, on his mobile somewhere, having evacuated his building, uh, Kevin is up for you in Bromley. Hi, Kevin, you're through to Daniel Corb. Hello, can I, can I speak to Daniel, please? Yeah, go right ahead. Uh, Daniel, can I ask you a question about the weather? Yeah, How are you certainly. Talking about the weather, huh? How how do I detect what uh, the what, the weather in the in say though you talk about New Zealand earlier on? Can I do I detect it through by satellites or how what's the what's the how is the way that they they detect whether major weather conditions are are on the horizon? Oh, well, it's lots and lots of different things. Of course, uh, satellites uh, actually allow us to see from space uh, the actual clouds, radar, uh, and the actual temperature, all the different sites and airports around the, the country, around the world. That gives us the observational information, a lot of which is then fed into uh, the main global com computer models. Uh, the UK uh, MO is, obviously is, has the main one. Is, yes, New Zealand one of the, is, is New Zealand where, where most of the major major weather conditions are occurring, or I mean, is that the area in, in that, is, that has the most the most major conditions, or are there um, other we, areas of the world that have more major conditions? Uh, yeah, I think uh, I can detect them. 
I think every, everywhere has their own unique uh, type of weather, even in the North Atlantic. And when you get into the winter, you get the active jet stream. Uh, New Zealand and the Southern Hemisphere being in winter right now, there's more energy in the atmosphere. So, you know, we're, we're in the throes of the Southern Ocean, which throw, is throwing some fairly dramatic weather systems at us at the moment. Uh, whereas further north into the Northern Hemisphere, parts of like uh, North America, you're enjoying summer. Uh, and over on the continent, it is quiet. So uh, southern areas, the southern hemisphere, the weather's a bit more active at the moment, being winter uh, and away from the direct rays of the sun. But uh, that obviously shifts around once the seasons start to change as well. Kevin, thanks very much for your call from Bromley. Uh, Tim in London says, does the recent blue moon and the upcoming blood moons in September affect the weather at all, like sun solar flares? Now, you should probably, before you answer the question for us, Daniel, explain what a blue moon and a blood moon is. Uh, well, good good question on the blood moon. Blue moon, of course, is, a, is the second full moon of the month, which we did have uh, the one at the end of July. Um, when it comes to moons, their big thing they do is, of course, they uh, affect the tides, uh, gravitational pull. Um, you know, and there are theories, and I know of people that do actual weather forecasting based on the gravitational pull and the tides. Um, but um, you know, conventional weather models uh, and weather forecasters don't use the tides as much. They're looking at more the um, their observation information, satellites, radars, and then the computer models, not counting as much what the uh, the moon and those sorts of things do. And, you know, there's even theories, if you can believe it, down here in New Zealand, uh, people talk about how um, the, the full moons and the new moons can affect uh, the number of earthquakes because, of course, we, you know, we see quite a few here uh, in New Zealand. So you can't completely discount them, but from the actual standard weather forecasting, they don't really have as much... Uh, uh, in the day-to-day -day, um, uh, play of, of, of things. Uh, Barry, next up for you. Barry's on the phone in Cornwall. Hi, Barry. Hello, Barry. Hello. What would you like to ask Daniel? Uh, I've just got to say that um, when you look at the jet stream, it always seems to wrap itself around the UK. And my theory is that the, the windmills that we have so many in this country uh, doesn't mean we don't we produce any heat from actual old-fashioned generators. And is that why the cold air from the one side of the jet stream is coming down over the UK? Um, good question. You have to remember as well the jet stream, uh, uh, the main core of the jet stream sits up at a pretty decent height. So it's sitting up at around, you know, the core is anywhere between 30 uh, and as much as 37,000 feet up. So it's, you know, it's basically where, where you'd be in a, in a jet plane. So you're talking about heat coming out of um, generators at the surface of the atmosphere. That wouldn't readily get up that high because that air technically would be uh, transported further, further along. But you know, we can't rule out what happens at the surface because we always, you know, in weather forecasting, we look at the sea temperature. And you look at, uh, for instance, what's happened in the UK. There's a big pool of cold water sitting to the west of the UK at the moment. Uh, so what happens at the surface of the Earth, you can't completely rule out uh, in the sense of how it can affect the jet stream. So, um, you know, it's, it's difficult to say as far as, you know, exactly for like those generators and things. But we always know what happens around a city uh, in the sense of how it affects the temperatures during the day compared to if you live in the country, the heat island effect. So um, small influences, yes, but there are the bigger things that can affect the weather too or the jet stream, the sea temperatures, which can affect the, how the, uh, the weather develop and then also the continental influence you think of like siberia that big mass of cold and snow in the winter but then also it's a big mass of uh, source of heat which if the winds are in the right direction can blow over to the uk uh, we can get our warm baking uh, summer days that uh, you know we, we, we can see barry yeah. thanks for your call thank you very much oh five hundred nine zero nine six nine three 693 gets you through to daniel corbett tonight uh phil brown uh has texted and says what's the real reason Daniel, for Red Sky at Night. Uh, it's not Shepherd's Delight. What is it? <laughs> it's actually to do with the uh, the actual positioning of the, the sun's rays. Obviously, that the sun's rays, if they're actually uh, falling through layers of cloud, layers of the atmosphere, uh, you're going to get that, um, that, that colour. You know, they always say Red Sky at Night, Shepherd's Delight, Red Sky in Morning, Sailors Take Warning, as is the case, because if you've got the red sky, the sun's sunrise is passing through layers of, uh, of some of that maybe mid and high level cloud and the particulates or bits in the atmosphere that we would sometimes see 
giving it that haze as opposed to on days where you have a big air of high pressure and you just got, you know, just gentler weather uh, and it's looking fine. Of course, the inversion, that the layer where the air warms above that position or in the, uh, the lower layers of the atmosphere, how high or how low it is can have an effect too. But always, yes, usually uh, when you're getting those red skies at night, indicating that your sort of your sun's rays uh, are at least departing for the remnants of your weather system that is in most cases clearing off to the east. There you go. Uh, next up is Ivor in St Helens. Uh, and I hope I pronounced this right for you, Daniel. Can you please tell us what the Maunder minimum was and could it happen in the next 100 years? The Maunder minimum, gosh, that is a, that is a, that is a good one. Um, you know, to be really honest, um, I, I'm not I'm not sure, and it, it rings a bell. Uh, but I'm not going to sit there and just throw something out and be no, incorrect. No, no, so no, it, fair enough. Yeah, I'm just it's uh, new to me. It's the uh, the name used for the period starting at about 4:45 and continuing to about 5:15 when sunspots become exceedingly rare. Mm. Ah, yes. Yeah, some, yeah, and, and of course, you know, and that's the other thing, sunspots, you know, we, we always you know, talk about them, people, uh, even in weather forecasting, you, you, you think they have an influence and they don't really know how much influence, but they're just like with the tides, you know, they, you can have, you know, uh, some sort of influence, particularly in the sense of the electromagnetics and, and all of that, you know, can play a part in the atmosphere as well. But, uh, uh, let's... yeah, and I'm, you know... Yeah, go on. No, so an apologies. Yeah, just sitting out, sitting outside of my mobile phone, so not in front of my computer. No, of course, no, 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 no. no. <laughs> no we should, should explain. Daniel's been uh, he's been evacuated from his building in New Zealand, uh, where he's talking to us from tonight. So he's on his mobile phone, doing his best to answer your questions, for which we're very grateful. Uh, Patrick in Kent, then I think you can take this one because you've referred to this all already, Daniel. The El Nino you were talking about. How Patrick wants to know how is it going to affect our weather this winter, if at all. Well, that's a, that's really curious because you know uh, that is the big you know, the uh, a thousand pound question. Everyone's wondering what will the El Nino do, and I would not draw a straight line and say, oh, it's going to do this, it's going to do that, because the two most important things it does. First off, it's warming the waters in the Pacific to levels that. This will probably be one of the strongest El Niños that's probably going to be peaking right about uh, just after New Year, going into January, February, and then it will ease away. So it warms the waters of the Pacific, so you've got all the extra steam and water vapor, just to give you an analogy, just rising up into the atmosphere. But at the same time, when you've got that extra water vapor, that's going to create more clouds, more storms, and those storms, i.e. the typhoons we're seeing in the Pacific, they provide more tropical energy, and then that gets into the jet stream. So we've got more energy flowing in the jet stream, and all of that is coming across, as we've seen it already, coming across North America, uh, over to the North Atlantic. But El Nino is only one part of the puzzle. There's all these other oscillations that we look at too, uh, you know, and just to, not to, to bore you with them all, but the North Atlantic oscillation, the Arctic oscillation, all those different ones look at the strength of the highs and the lows. So the positioning of the North Atlantic oscillation coupled with the energy from the El Nino will determine what happens if our um, oscillation is in the right direction. We, of course, in the winter, we look to the east of Siberia. If there's that cold air uh, and we get a block, we always get into that colder. But with El Nino, you'd also favor more of the westerly and the energy coming from the Atlantic, which would give us that typical uh, wet and kind of windy and kind of yucky, uh, but mild winter. But if you get a bit of a breakdown, there could be that cold. So it's difficult to pin it down and say it's going to be cold or it's going to be wet. But I, I would first off say we're going to get a lot of energy or um, motion and weather systems from the Atlantic. But we can't rule out Mother Nature in the back of the room saying, ha ha, remember, <laughs> and all of a sudden introducing that little bit of a cold block and an easterly. So uh, I think unpredictability will be one of the key words for uh, the winter as with El Nino as it plays it's almost like you know Mother Nature puts on that sort of that mask and sort of comes out and says ha ha you didn't recognize me did you and, and it just sort of throws all the weather forecasts and, and but extreme weather as well as you've been seeing and we will continue to see as well things that you know hey we haven't seen that for a while or you know those sorts of things into uh, daily weather forecasts. Daniel, thank you so much for carrying on with us despite your uh, little fire evacuation that you've had there in New Zealand. Uh, we trust that it's just a drill and that everyone is safe and well. And thank you for bearing with us and talking to us tonight. Daniel Corbett, meteorologist from New Zealand this evening. Five to one. 